Um, so I am a in Minnesota and then a postdoc at Duke in, in Colorado State. This is an, uh, an informal introduction to JavaFlex. So I want you, I, mean, I know you guys got started downloading uh, the software and playing with it a little bit last week. Uh, an overview to where you can find things and then also um, <clears throat> what software packages are out there. So let me see if I can share my screen. I have this share screen button, but it's, um, oh, I don't know the presenter right now. Uh, I think Katie is the presenter right now. Uh, that uh, <laughs> am I going to do something about that? I'm, okay. I'm now, now, now I can share the screen. So. <laughs> do you guys hear me? Yeah. So this is the uh, uh, homepage for JavaPlex. And let me show you where some of the links are. So, um, here's a tutorial. Can you my mouse? Yeah. yeah. Here's a link to the tutorial. I'll, I'll largely be flipping through the tutorial a bit today. Um, there's a wiki page with, with some documentation on JavaFlex. So, this is uh, roughly what the, what the Wikipedia page looks like. And materials, you go to this latest release right here. So when I click on this latest release button, uh, get to the, the, the and you can download the tutorial here. All the code is in this folder called MATLAB examples. All right. So any questions about getting around on the web page at all? I, I guess the other thing I should point out is there's also this uh, Java doc documentation right here. So if you click on that, every you write a software package in Java, it creates this documentation uh, for you automatically. So there's good stuff in here, although JavaFlex is not perfect about documenting. Okay, so I'm flipping now to the, to the tutorial. Here's what the tutorial looks like. And the first section, uh, contains a little bit of information about other software packages, which I want to talk about briefly. Why Plex or why other software packages? So there are options, and you guys should weigh your options strongly. Um, I think one of the edges of JavaFlex is that it's pretty beginner friendly. You're not the best computer programmer in the world. JavaFlex is a, a fairly easy package to get started in, and lots of examples say in the tutorial or other places. However, some disadvantages of JavaFlex. First of all, it, it relies on MATLAB. So if you don't have access to MATLAB, JavaFlex is much harder to use. You can use JavaFlex Java, but that requires a fair amount of programming knowledge. And if you're good enough to use JavaFlex just in Java without MATLAB, you might well use another package like Dionysus or Perseus, in my opinion. Here's the two other software packages. Um, nice is uh, sort of a pretty strong, powerful C++ package. Curtis by Vidit Nanda is another powerful C++ package. Powerful in the sense that they can do bigger computations. You might be missing some of the bells and whistles that JavaFlex has. So for example, I don't think either of these packages have witness complexes. In there, so you could do V scripts complexes. I think you can do witness complexes. Um, I need to date this uh, introduction. So there's there's so this R package by Brittany Therese Fossey. Patrick has worked with. Um, there's a CTL sort package that's in development by Ryan Lewis. Use C plus um, plus. I think the advantages of JavaFlex are that it's easy for beginners. It's well documented with the tutorial, and there's lots of examples. It has things like witness complexes. 
some images are it's computationally powerful as other these other, some of these packages. So if you want to do bigger and bigger computations, you might end up moving to another software package. Things about that those different options. Uh, I've seen that there is a, a pre on the archive kind of uh, comparing the different uh, four packages. Have you seen that? I've run across that. I didn't look at it deeply. Do you remember who it was by or anything like that? Uh, there's a lot, lot of people. I just remember Catherine Hess was on there. That's the only name I recognize. But it does kind of like, they okay. actually like kind of um, different. They do sort of an objective analysis of pros and cons of each and stuff. It's pretty cool. I did run across that. Yeah. So, I mean, hear me say later today, um, computation size is, is something that, that um, well, there's no perspectives. Um, I think lots of people try to do computations that are too big, too fast. I think you want to clean your data set to start off with a smaller computation. And if you're getting interesting results for small computations, then you want to move on to bigger computations. So my impression just from getting emails from people using JavaFlex is that too many people don't really understand their data and want to go to big computations right away. And my advice would be, you know, clean up and try to build the computations first. Uh, sometimes I think the, the big computations are unnecessary at first until until you really uh, have a feel for your data. Yeah. Well, a software I should mention is that there are uh, there's this Mapper software program and IGASI. Mapper and IGASI are, are basically built on the same algorithm, which is different from persistent homology. So the software packages we've been talking about are for persistent homology. Not IGASI are for doing something different. Mapper is um, Freely available academic software, There's a Python version of Mapper, and then IOSD is, is corporate software. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So, interrupting me with questions. Let's continue the tutorial. I just want to give you guys an overview of some of the things in this tutorial, and I'll point out some highlights that I think are important. So here are instructions. I think you guys may um, part way through instructions. If you go to the JavaFlex webpage, you'll download this folder called MATLAB examples. And if you uh, change into that directory, MATLAB examples, then this load JavaFlex script. And once you run that script, then JavaFlex is all ready to go. Okay. And, and in MATLAB examples, there are a couple of folders. The ones I think are the most important are basic examples, like some examples. Tutorial examples is the one I most it. It contains all examples corresponding to the tutorial. The tutorial has solutions. And for the tutorial solutions, uh, you have scripts that give uh, code coded answers to all the exercises in the tutorial. So. Um, let me just tutorial solutions, and you know exercise one. Here's a script that solves exercise one for you. And um, I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head what exercise one was, but you can type in the name of this script into the command uh, window, and it'll show you. Okay. So here's the code that you might write if you were solving exercise one on your own. And if you don't want to copy and paste that code, you can just in the name of the script. Okay. And let me change to tutorial examples. Um, these are all the scripts corresponding to the tutorial. Okay. So the tutorial just can contain a very brief overview overview of some social complexes. Build some social complexes when you have a growing complex. Um, JavaFlex filters some social complexes or, or streams. I guess computer science term. Okay. 
All right, brief tangent. So Patrick and I were talking about this before everybody else joined. But, um, I'll say Alvaplex has has three containers. Um, my best demo, Joe Hansen, he helped write Plex, which was the precursor to Javaplex, uh, or J, I guess. And only on the uh, documentation side, so I helped maintain the tutorial and answer a lot of questions over email. So please do get in touch with me if you have any questions. And then there's Andrew Taos, who, um, who wrote the JavaPlex software. Now, I'm no longer in academia, so uh, updates and improvements to the software are, are now becoming more and more rare. Okay? There are definite things that we know should be improved in JavaPlex, would like to be improved, but may or may not get improved, say, within the next six months or the next year. That's, that's something to consider as well. JavaPlex is in a pretty stable, useful state, but probably won't get extended. Too much further, is my guess going forward. All right, so it's important to keep in mind different ways of building simplicial complexes, and one is, is just explicit simplex streams. Essentially, you tell JavaPlex what simplicial complex you want to build, and, and JavaPlex will do it. This is, this is a very flexible tool. It's building a simplicial complex through a standard way. You're not doing Viator scripts, you're not doing witness complexes. You can definitely do that in Java class. So um, let me go down to this how example. So in 3.2, here's where we create an explicit simplex stream and tell JavaPlex precisely the simplicities that we want to add. So at time zero, we're adding vertex one. At time zero, we add vertex two, etc. Now at time one, we add vertex five. And then we can edge it at different times. Here we edge one, two times zero, et cetera. And actually we add a two simplex. So it's a pretty uh, straightforward syntax for building whatever some filtered simplicial complex you want. And you can sort of you know, the MATLAB script corresponding to this example is called house example. So open in uh, MATLAB, in the MATLAB world, Open up that script, open house, oops, example, and the script. So you, so you recognize commands from the tutorial, they're also all typed up for you in MATLAB. So if not, you can copy and paste these commands in order to, to try them out one by one, or you could type house example, uh, and it'll do it all at once for you. And so it's computing barcode. On to that, that example. So now I'll go through the tutorial and give you some highlights of things I think are important but often overlooked. So all you compute and intervals. This is the thing that's computing a representative cycle. So, for example, um, in, in one dimensional homology, in the filter simplicial complex, we got two holes. We got one hole corresponding to the square, and a hole that, that corresponded to this triangle before the two simplexes are added. Okay. And you can compute representative generators. So, you see, um, you see cycle corresponding to the triangle before it's filled in, and just cycle of four edges that was corresponding to the open square. Um, one thing to keep in mind about representative cycles is that they're not necessarily consist or the geometrically minimal cycles. So if you print your shape as an annulus, right, you might hope that the cycle JavaFlex gives you is, is the inner circle, the smallest circle of that annulus. But uh, it's just the nature of that, that uh, finding a nice cycle is nowhere optimized in the calculation. You might get a cycle that, that wiggles and, and waves a lot all the way around the annulus. So around the annulus once, but it's extremely wiggly. Sometimes you might get out a nice geometric cycle, but no guarantee of that. And software package I know of, if they give you a uh, presentative cycle, going to be um, 
like the nicest one you would hope for. Okay. To uh, point from data. So pretend you're given a, a set of points in some Euclidean space, and now you want to build either a Vietor strips or perhaps witness complex on top of that data set. Okay. There's two ways that you can represent a data set in JavaPlex. One is if your data set lives in Euclidean space, if you have points in Euclidean space, then start with a matrix where you have one point on each row. And the number of columns is the dimension of your space. So here are five points in 2D, reports by a matrix, and you build uh, some social complexes on top of that. One thing often look, you don't need Euclidean data. So another option is your data is coming from somewhere else, and you have some similarity. And this part is now a distance matrix. Okay, so you have uh, five points, and you know the pairwise distance between any two of those points. That's completely fine information, and complex can work with that. So here you have a, a distance matrix. Maybe it's from points in Euclidean space, maybe not. Then to build a Vietor strips for a witness complex on top of there. Okay. The exercises I think are fun. So the point of these exercises is uh, you can sample points from just a, a little square in the plane, all right? And then you can build a metric that identifies the opposite side. Say it identifies the opposite sides to get a torus, or it identifies the opposite sides to get a fine bottle. And really sampling points from a torus or from a fine bottle. And you, you know, do I recover the shape of the torus or the fine bottle? These exercises are all, well, the solutions are all coded up for you already. So let's look at exercise four, your standpoints from a square, and then uh, producing a torus. Let's see, so the idea of that is uh, get out of the um, tutorial examples directory, uh, change to the tutorial solutions directory, let's run exercise four. Let's see, let's open it first. And let's run it. Not going to be any output here. <laughs> actually, continued by exercise 16. And at 16, we actually compute the topology of the space. So let's open exercise 16. And let's run it. And I'll get the torus output. Output from exercise. 16, and you can see in dimension zero, we have one long bar. Dimension one, we have two long bars corresponding to the two holes in the torus. And dimension two, we get one long bar corresponding to the void. Yeah. Questions? something that I think is, is quite important. So this next chapter in the tutorial is about how you build streams or build filters and social compasses on top of your point cloud data. So this paragraph right here is, is explaining the points that you get to choose to limit the size of your computation. So this is very important is Tmax. Uh, is, is, or sorry, let me. One is not very important is, is capital N. What capital N is doing is not computing our simplicial complex at every real value. You know, the Viator strips complex, for example, grows with the scale parameter. We're computing the, the, the simplicial complex at every real scale parameter. Instead, we're disguising the real line. And only computing the uh, the torus complex at those finite grid points in our discretization. Okay, so you can make that discretization uh, pretty large, and you won't increase the running time of your computation. So, uh, 
this will, n is, is the number of divisions put right here. So m divisions is the number of times you divide up uh, your, your uh, real one. Oops. All right, D is slightly more important. D max is the maximum dimension of the simplices that you include. So if you put D max as four, then you only include up to four dimensional simplices. Okay. Um, and means you can only compute homology up to dimension three. Okay. Homology dimension three relies on having the four dimensional simplices to be your boundaries. Okay. So if you include simplices up to dimension four, you can only compute homology up to dimension Three. The most important uh, parameter is T max, or the maximum filtration time. Uh, so we put some code. This is the uh, maximum filtration value. Yeah. This is crucially important. So what's controlling is um, going back to this uh, torus barcode picture. We curated the bar goes all the way up to and so past point, point 0.1. Okay. T max is this point 0.1 value where we treated up to point 0.1 and then we didn't go any farther. So if that T max to be point 0.06, then you would only compute up to here. You'd only see this part of the picture. So the obvious thing I want to make is that these simplicial complexes can become very large very fast. And so you want to start off by setting too large because then you just won't the computation won't ever finish. And then start with T max embarrassingly small, okay? And your computation will finish right away and you'll only see what's what's left of T max. So if you set T max to be 0.01, uh, your computation will finish in a split second and you only see what's the barcode to the left of 0.01. And you'll go, oh, okay, my code's working. I just need to slowly raise T max. And then, when you gradually raise T max, you get more and more of the barcodes. You can track how many simplices you have, you know, each value of T max. And, and uh, you know, you can get up to the order of millions of simplices, but in complex, you can't get past hundreds of millions of simplices. So you're watching how the number of simplices grow as you're raising T max. So why this is really relevant is Java is not the most computationally efficient software package, but even the most computationally efficient software packages, people can ask them to do unreasonable things. So, so for example, let's say we have 100 vertices. That's a really small data set. Okay. The full simplicial complex on 100 vertices, that has two to the 100 simplices in it. I think that's, you know, that's getting close to the order of magnitude of the number of atoms in the universe. So if you have any of these software packages to do something unreasonable, you know, sputter and die. You can't, you know, the via torus rips complex on top of just 100 vertices, and you don't limit the size of the simple complex, then you're going to run out of steam very fast. So if you have a number of simplices up to dimension, say, four, then you can have n the number of vertices. You're going to have roughly um, n these, n two edges, and three triangles, and four tetrahedra. So that's, that's how the order of growth depends on the dimension you include. Um, but T max is how you limit the size. So if you pay, pay your maximum filtration value to be smaller and smaller, then you won't include as many simplices. And so you want to start with your maximum filtration size small, see how mutation is growing as you increase it, and increase it slowly. Okay. All right. So here we have torus rips complexes. Uh, doing via torus rips complex on the torus. They're called a witness complex. So if you haven't heard of a witness complex before, a witness complex is a way to um, down the fact that via torsion rips complexes get really big really quickly. Loosely, the idea is that, that you only include a subset of your vertices as, sorry, you only include a subset of your set point as vertices. 
So let's say instead of a thousand points, maybe you only include include two hundred of them as vertices. But those complex uh, builds a reasonable, some social complex approximation of your data set just on a smaller subset of vertices. Your points in your data set uh, help decide when edges appear or help the some triangles appear. So that's the of a, of a witness complex. You choose mark set a smaller subset of vertices of data set uh, to be the vertices of your simplicial complex. So there you could choose your um, your land. Your your data set was point samples from a figure eight. You could choose landmarks landmarks randomly, which would give you vertices that look like this on the left, or this procedure called um, six point lax min, which is used to divide and choose your uh, mark vertices, the functional maximum, and then your vertex set gets spaced out more easily. Okay. So things I want to highlight. One of the novel flex is that in this tutorial, we have some real live data sets coded up, and you can do go through these examples. So these are sets that appear published in papers. So this one uh, is on work that I did without, when I was in graduate school. It's on a, a data set of range image packet patches. So I'll go through that if you like. Um, data sets. Let's start of this section. This is section 6.2. This is from one of the most famous papers by topology. It's from the nine bottle data set and natural images. So um, the Klein bottle data set is this primary circle model of eight patches at all choices of angle. And then three circle model that can both uh, linear patches at all cho choices of angle. Two secondary circles correspond to quadratic patches in either the horizontal or vertical direction. So if you haven't seen this paper, I would, I would recommend you check it out. Let me just show you that, that this is all coded up for you to play, play with. Uh, go back to the right directory. So this is in tutorial examples. And then the optical, optical example. It's all true. And let me just let's run it. And I'll give you guys the output. It doesn't take very long. So the observation here is that if you clean your data set and choose all the terms appropriately, you know, uh, you get interesting topology without too much running time. See the, the model on the outside. We have the primary circle, and then the space cross. It's in the middle. This is a, a circle here and a circle here. This is, example, the circle of quadratic patches in the vertical direction and the circle of quadratic patches in the horizontal direction. The circle model has bed one of five, five and you have the output. We have one connected component and uh, one dimensional small topology of rank five. Are you guys familiar with this example? The yeah. Data. yeah, please, yes. Yeah. There's a view. Yeah. Cool. More added example to the tutorials is the cyclo octane data set. I'm guessing fewer of you are familiar with this data set. Are you, have any of you heard of the cyclo octane data set? No. Okay. Let me let me pull up a picture. Just that I think this is uh, under not to be. So that's really what I think. Okay. octane. Here's a picture of single octane. It's a molecule in dark gray. We have eight carbon atoms. And three, we have um, 16 hydrogen atoms. 
two hydrogens are sticking off of each carbon. So it's just a molecule. Okay. You can molecule, you can, you know, this molecule can bend and stretch around in three-dimensional space. So formation of this molecule, you know, bend or stretch in 3D. You can set that as uh, a point, say, in, uh, we'll do 24 dimensions. So think about the hydrogen atoms and only look at the eight carbons. So eight carbon atoms, eight locations in 3D. And in this carbon location, we have an X, Y, Z coordinate. So atoms, eight points times three coordinates gives you 24 numbers. So you can think of confirmation of, of these carbons as a point in 24-dimensional space. All right. So this is the confirmation space of cyclooctane. It's a projection from this, this sheet in 24 dimensions down you know, to this visualization in, in 2D or 3D. So the confirmation space of this molecule, molecule it turns to be a sphere, which you guys see, a line bottle glued on the inside. So this hourglass type shape is a climb bottle, actually. And it's glued to the sphere along two circles of intersection. So here's one circle of intersection, and here's the other circle of intersection. So this is a fantastic data set, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the great examples I know of, of, of data sets with, with fantastic shapes. It's a sphere with a climb bottle glued on the inside. The climb is attached along two circles. Um, this, this example is also in Java Flex. Um, right, so let's open a little octane example. Here's the, the data uh, for you when you when you download things. The data included when you download things. Let's run it. So we have 24 dimensions, 8,000. And here's the, the um, <coughs> so it's out when you take a sphere and you glue a bottle along the inside, you have one connected component, you have uh, uh, one glue, and now you have two voids, one from the sphere, and then gluing the climb ball bottle on the inside actually can make, creates another void. Okay, example. I think that's cool. So some of the references are listed in the tutorial. I, I, rec I recommend you guys check out this tech because I think confirmation spaces and molecules are, are potential places for other interesting data sets with, with, uh, with uh, wild topological shapes. Okay, a couple of remarks which are important. First of all, um, it's not hard to run memory. MATLAB sets their memory limit pretty low. This section 7.1 is really more about how to increase the, uh, the limit that MATLAB sets. So this is my remark about limiting the computation size by limiting the size of your some social complex. I always want to do that first. And only once you understand the way you're building your system push complex really well, making sure you're doing it in an intelligent manner, only then should you consider increasing the, the size of Java complex. For example, none of the examples in this tutorial, even those real-life data sets, require you to increase the heap size. So, um, yeah. So, so think about things before you increase the heap size. Are you, are you doing things in the most efficient, intelligent manner that you Okay, you can write your own MATLAB functions, so, uh, but there's some tricks, and those tricks are explained here, explained here. And you can compute bottleneck distance. Um, so I don't think you can compute larger than distance, which is too bad. Then there are these. I think the first appendix is crucial. So first appendix is about choosing dense core subsets. So Fact of the matter is that kind of taking a data set and building a simplicial complex and then producing the barcodes is not robust with respect to non-Hausdorff noise. 
What does that mean? So non-Hausdorff noise is you have a, a set of points, and non-Hausdorff noise is when you add just a few points, but far away. Okay. So pretend that it's millions and millions of points sampled from a circle. Okay. If we do a complex on top of that and get the barcodes, we'll recover the circle. Add in some non-Hausdorff noise. So we'll just add in three noisy points, but those noisy points are far away from the circle. Maybe they're right in the middle of the circle. Okay. So if you have millions and millions of points a circle and scale just in three or six or twelve points near the middle, when you put complex on top of those points, it doesn't matter that there's only three or twelve points in the middle. Those are fill in the circle right away. Okay. So this is uh, the point that. Um, Constructions are not robust with respect to just a few noisy points. So what's commonly done is to filter your data set with respect to density first. You're going to throw out the points that have low density, according to measure of density. Those are your gas and noisy points, and you keep your points with high density levels. All right. So this is a pre-processing technique that, uh, that you should consider. And you you need to keep in mind if your data set's noisy, you're going to have to do something about it before you build a simplicial complex on top of it. So, there are ways to handle noise, but this just talks about one of the, um, uh, I guess, most uh, fair handed ways. So, all right, and that there's uh, explanations of all the exercises. So I showed you some of the scripts where you have the code for all the exercises, but at the very end there's some text explaining those scripts and explain where those and drawing pictures of those solutions. And, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. So please, please uh, ask questions. Put um, barcodes for a long time. Um, can you get persistent diagrams for the data as well? Good question. So, as far as I know, Java doesn't have um, a way to plot the persistence diagrams. Okay. However, you can use um, the persistence barcodes. You can also just return the starting and death time. In a lab matrix. Mm -hmm. All of you are aware in the tutorial that is. Once you have the points of reverse and the death times in the MATLAB matrix, then you can just put it just points in the plane. And so MATLAB is good at plotting points. So you can just plot those points as if there were any points in the plane. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you fancy your script that you could you could take those first and death times and plug them into your scripts. Associate some other software package that would give you a um, um, diameter of the uh, barcode plot. So that's another option. Okay. Let me where that is in the tutorial. Because I guess you can look to that fairly often. Um, uh, computing for system homology, section 3.2. <clears throat> Is when when you call this, you know, the persistence intervals for this this house example, um, map will print this to your screen, so it'll, it'll print, you know, these are your interval in dimension one, and these are your intervals in dimension zero. And that's not the most useful format. This is like a string; it's a, a string of text, and you don't want to have to do the string processing to pull out those those numbers. But here, example. Right at the top of page seven, how the command is called to change the matrix. So here's the uh, dimension zero barcodes now turned into a matrix. So we had one bar that went from zero to infinity, so that's one row of our matrix. And then another bar that went from one to two, so that's another row of our matrix. And so you get matrix of, of first and of the first one, and then of death times in the second column. Um, and then you just plot those any points in the plane.
And for, uh, just just tips for how to clean data or, or um, besides this dense course subset stuff? Yeah. So, um, let me stop sharing my screen and share my face. Um, so, up one second. I think the pre processing is really hard. Hard part. The pre processing of logical data set data analysis, in my opinion, that's the hard part. You know, the easy part is then you pre process your data set is, is producing the interval. So the reason why the pre processing is, is the hard part is because it's used intervals that you can't interpret, right? You know, um, it's hard to produce intervals where you can interpret them. This is what the intervals correspond to. So, um, and Luke, your, so your question was. Is about Cleaning the data. So I think let me back up again. I think probably two um, you for for topological data analysis with respect to persistent homology that makes sense. And for people, is usually you want to realize which of the two camps you're in, and you want to get confused and straddle the two camps. So one camp is, you know, those examples that I showed you about uh, this Klein bottle and natural image data or the cyclo octane molecule, which was a sphere with a, uh, a Klein bottle glued on the inside. Right. Those where you have a data set that for some reason, you know, the fantastically beautiful shape, you're not quite sure which shape you have. So the kids knew that the cyclo octane data set was a dimensional manifold of singularity. They didn't know which one. If you're in that position, um, then I like clean your data, uh, as we'll discuss a bit more in a moment, and then you will some social complex where you can interpret the intervals as, as corresponding to the shape of that data set, right? A long, one interval will be a loop in your data. Okay, that's one camp. That makes complete sense and logically consistent. Okay. The other that you might be in is maybe your data set's a little bit messier. Maybe you don't think it's some beautiful Klein bottle, uh, but maybe you want to use topological data analysis to study some of the local features, some of the local geometry, and you want to do a machine learning task, right? You want to uh, identify a uh, type versus another type. Okay. So there, you don't have to build your complexes as carefully because you don't necessarily need to be able to interpret the barcode. You're just using the barcode to produce new learning vectors and then a machine learning task. So there, you, you need uh, much more, uh, as long as what you do works for your machine learning task, then you don't have to understand what the barcodes corresponded to. So I guess the distinction was, in one camp, you need to build your simplicial complex so that you can interpret your first, you know, if you get a long one-dimensional bar, what does that mean? And then the camp, uh, you're not necessarily building an interpretation of the bars. You just, you just some hope that maybe those, those bar first and depth times will be good machine learning vector coordinates. I've, I've avoided your question long enough. The next question was about cleaning data. Uh, the method I talked about was just thresholding your data. So throwing away the data that's, that's not and you're keeping the data that is dense. So there, what threshold level of density are you using? Um, and in that time bottle paper, they observe that when they use, um, you know, different thresholds, they get different shapes. Or maybe more accurately, when they use different estimates of density, they get different shapes. So they use a, first a global estimate of density, and they get a circle model. And they use more local estimate of density, they get this three circle model. And then both, most uh, uh, local estimate of density, they get a Klein bottle model. So that, that's a, uh, an observation that you know, have different uh, bandwidths on your density. Are you looking at Gaussians with large tails or, or spiky Gaussians? You know, global estimate of density or, or a local estimate of density? You know, those in different data sets might give you different interesting shapes. Okay. Kind of thresholding with 
respect to density. Uh, you know, what you'd rather do instead of thresholding with, with density, you'd want to, um, instead of using that density threshold, you have to include more and more points as they, as they become less and less dense. Fortunately, that's getting into multidimensional persistence, which is harder to mm -hmm. compute. So we looked at adding more and more points in as you as you increase density, but uh, um, but that you have two scales now. You have how many points are you including as you as you uh, density threshold along with you know scale parameter for the VHR ships complex. So I think currently done oftentimes is you can't vary both of these parameters, so you just choose one to fix. Um, yeah, and then you make different choices on that fixed parameter. So there's a uh, room for improvement there. Neat. Yeah, any follow up questions regarding to that, Luke? I mean, no. Thinking about getting data sets nice. So, yeah. I'll say that um, <clears throat> it's very noisy. Say it's coming from biological, biological applications, perhaps. Example. Usually, you'll be in the machine learning camp. Your data is noisy enough that you don't expect to clean it up and get a client bottle. Maybe you expect to clean it up and get a circle, say if it's got it. But oftentimes, you'll be more in the machine learning camp. You, want, you know, maybe you want to clean the data so that it's reasonable, but that you're. Uh, you're not necessarily going to have an interpretation of these barcodes when they come up. And, and for your data, I think uh, algorithms like IASDs, IRIS, or IASDs, IASD core, or the upper algorithm, those are essentially interesting ones to look at for noisier data sets. Uh, for symbology, the difficulty with, with the data sets is this. They're robust with respect to non Hausdorff noise phenomenon I mentioned, right? Like, you know, points are on the circle, if you just have a couple of points scattered in the middle, some places like, might not recover that, that circle. Mm -hmm. Since Luke, I think Larry Wasserman's group a really good paper about how to handle some of uh, noisy data sets since he thinks more like a statistician. So that might be a group you want to go take a look at some of their work with the R package. Okay. Yeah. So Patrick, I don't I haven't used the R package before, but they have some of the code built in to run the like uh, noisy data. You might have that already coded up. Is that right? Yeah, they, they they work a lot with uh, kernel smoothers um, in their in their data sets. Um, just because in statistics we just assume it's noisy, so we'll generally to smooth things out. And, um, so like what you were talking about with this idea, um, you know, we'll smooth data, and that'll put. They do more than just thresholding with respect to density, right? Do you remember roughly what they do? Yeah, I, I recall they use, uh, they have several different approaches and in, built into their package, but uh, they'll do things like distance to measure, I think is a concept uh, Fred Chazal worked on, was written sensibly about. Um, and then they just use a, a simple bootstrapping mechanism. Um, they do quite a few things in their package to do really nice, uh, they've proven really statistical results about recovering uh, the true statistical results, uh, in essence, uh, behind That's it. really good. So, yeah, there's a lot of good work there, actually. I'm pleased with it. Um, I have a concern. So uh, a big thing for me is being able to visualize uh, Structure. Like when you look at the confirmation space, um, I'm a lot in biology, and so I'm dealing with. I specifically I do RNA seq. So for me, a data set is you know, it could be hundreds of thousands of features, and it's incredibly noisy. Um, a lot of thing to do is. Uh, 
I fall into that machine learning camp at the end of the day. But uh, I, I really want to be able to visualize these structures. Um, I was wondering if you knew of anybody, any work that's been done. I know there's some visualization tools in JavaPlex, but, uh, you know, standing, like showed in the confirmation space, to me that's excellent. Uh, you projected down to a lower dimensional space and you saw this really beautiful structure for which you can probably study uh, behavior of things. You could probably see the relationships that you want to you wanna study. And so I was wondering if you were familiar with anything that out there that might uh, kind of processes to recover structural dimensional settings. And then a question for you, uh, like, maybe about what dimension of social complexes are you building? Well, that, that for now, um, so looking at will be probably chromosome confirmation capture technology, which is three-dimensional representations of uh, uh, the genome. So you get three-dimensional spatial coordinates for your genome. And so not only I know where what, what gene expression is, but I know their, their physical relationship to each other in space. Uh, so in that setting, I might be working something as high as four-dimensional. So physical location of genes plus expression. Um, but I, I, my thing is if, if I wanted to work in a, you know, gene and with that I have information on 100 patients. So I, I, I work in that space, for instance. Um, so, okay, uh, just a couple, couple hundred comments about your visualization question. So, I mean, as you, as you know, there's this visualization tool related to JavaPlex that Andrew Tausch coded up. I've actually never used that. I don't really know the ideas behind it. Um, I mean, you know, graph visualization techniques, visualizing graphs in two dimensions or in three dimensions, and I the IOC software or the Mapper software where you use graphs and use those graph visualization techniques. When you have a uh, simplicial complex, use the visualization of the underlying one filter, the underlying graph, um, is, is what you're looking for with regards to visualizations, right? Because as you have this extra two simplex and three simplex information, but the position of the two simplex and the three simplex is just determined by where its edges are. Yeah. So, so graph visualization tools are, are potentially useful there. Um, and, and a lot of such gradualization. I mean, you bring up a really good point because um, you know, pictures in the tutorial um, Java Plex or what persistent homology gives you is if you say five bars. Right, it says you have four loops, but it doesn't tell you, you know, what what those four loops look like. And yeah. so there's a really big step going those. Okay, we know we have a space that has five loops. I would estimate in it. It's a really big jump from going from this to going to the visualization here, like that, or even in the cyclo octane. You know, the huge jump from saying, okay, I think we have one connected component, one one dimensional hole, two two dimensional to go back to that, that surface I was showing you guys. Yeah. Um, so, and I'd say that, I mean, that's where new algorithms beyond persistent homology are needed. So persistent homology doesn't really address that step, which is a crucial important step. Yeah. Um, so okay, I'm going to write this myself. <laughs> Which is a problem. I don't mind doing it. It's just kind of I'm hoping somebody might have. Because when you're doing science, it's it's that I know what the structure is, but it, you know, it, reading some of these papers, you make a conclusion that well, a lot, a lot of this important stuff is organized around a loop. So it might be important to know what is close to that loop, and we have 
doing that and maybe visualizing it in a low dimension. Since dealing dealing with biologists, they like to do things visually. I mean, that's, that's right. No, I mean, so I want to advise you. So I think, well, I want you to think about yourself because I think there's a lot of uh, price to be made on the visualization type of question, right, of course. Yeah. I would recommend that you use, like, research the literature. And I'm out that, um, that this is a step beyond persistent homology. So, so you might not find it in lots of the, you know, papers that are addressing persistent homology. But um, I'm interfining coordinates for a loop. Um, I think there are, it, it does a literature search, but one place you might want to look is, is this um, um, homology coordinates paper. So I think the authors are Murzov and Mike Vegetemo Johansson and Vin De Silva. Shoot me an email if you can't find it. But the idea is using persistent homology to find coordinates. Um, well, there's coordinates along a circle. So uh, you then color your data set with respect to its coordinates along a circle. So, so what they do in that paper is, let's say you find a long one-dimensional bar in your barcode. Mm -hmm. Then you say, oh, there's evidence of a loop. Let's coordinate for this loop and color your data set with respect to those coordinates. Um, yeah. I'm going to find that paper, and, and I'll send it to you. Who were the uh, authors? I mean, Silva, you said was. Vince Silva, Dmitry Morozov, and Michael Vejdemo Johansson. Let me see if I just Google the title uh, quick. Um, so homology and circular co coordinates are the buzzwords. Yeah, I'm looking more in the computational geometry software because I figured this is something they would have tried to tackle. Is Helix. Yeah, and I think it's one of these problems that people have addressed, but there's no ground. Truth, right? So definitely room for improvement. So here's the paper. The um, intercalar coordinates. I guess the Moore's off. Uh, maybe it wasn't another. It's published by now, so this is just a pre-print version. But yeah, it's the start. Yeah. I hope, I mean, any of you guys feel free to shoot me emails or, or bug me with more questions. Any sir. All right, well, Dr. Adams, for your time and just today, it was greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.